Yeah, computing computing is one of those things which uh, you can just stay warm inside. Uh, <laughs> nowadays, you can stay in your pajamas, and uh, it's <laughs> it's you a good stay life. home. <laughs> you can stay home. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I was on an O'Reilly uh, productivity uh, seminar this morning, and everybody was talking about what it was like to be working uh, during the pandemic, and uh, uh, a lot of a lot of people uh, promoted the the uh, the benefit of, be, of being able to stay in your pajamas. So, Randy, are you continuing to work at home as well? Other than your field trip? I got permission to uh, go back to my lab. I'm okay. the first person in my building. It's very lonely. <laughs> my co-op student and I are there all the time now. Oh. Uh, Randy, Randy, do you have to be masked or does it matter? When I'm in my office, I don't have to. Okay. But if you go out to a common area, you have to wear it. Yeah, the whole rest of the time with the mask. Oh. Yeah, that makes sense. But I convince them that I'm dealing with atoms, not just with bits. <laughs> <laughs> you can't take the atoms home with you? Well, I did somewhat, but I couldn't bring a co-op student to my house, so. Okay. <laughs> and I guess you can't really take your lab equipment home necessarily either, right? Well, I did. I brought a bunch <laughs> of my lab equipment home. And the crazy thing is, uh, between the equipment that I didn't use for almost two years and the equipment that got moved back and forth, uh, a lot of stuff isn't working. Mm -hmm. you no, know, you got to keep using stuff for them to work. Yeah. So it's uh, it's very humbling. I'm having to do a lot of problem solving, and my poor co-op student is kind of you know she goes as far as she can until I say, okay, now you got to wait till I fix this piece of equipment to do the next step. Not not very rewarding from her side of things. <laughs> well. She gets to see what science is really like. <laughs> well, you, you know, it's it's not a it's not a bad thing to encounter broken things and fix them. In fact, that's that's a good good thing. Yeah. Actually. It's yeah. one of the ways I self-validate. I am so pleased when I can get things working. <laughs> it's very satisfying, that's for sure. <laughs> there was an old uh, NASA engineer who said that the best thing you can do as an engineer is break things because you learn more when you break things than anything else so that was his <laughs> mantra was use stuff break it and find out why and fix it <laughs> well we're just coming up on um 25 two, so welcome everybody to uh the last astro cafe of january seems like we're uh, the year is just flying by but anyways um Welcome and joining us. Uh, so far on the list for tonight, I have Randy and Reg. Are you doing a follow-up there? Well, we'll see uh, how much other stuff you've got. Um, uh, I think uh, Randy uh, did is working. You're going to do something that triggered a flashback in me and uh, on me of a an old presentation I did about uh, 2017, and I might present that if there's time. Sure. And, and then, hey, Chris, Chris, could you give me a couple of minutes for the SIGs? There's two yeah. of them this week. Yeah. And then um, we have Nathan. And we have a couple of items from Edmonton. And so now David, and I don't know, Chris Gaynor, do you have um, any updates and stuff you could share with us this evening? Um, very brief update on the, uh, on the JWST. And... Uh, uh, I don't know if Lori has an update, but uh, I might uh, have something to say as part of her update. And so on that note, Lori, do you have an update? Uh, more earthly matter, shall we say. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I got my handbook today. Yay. <laughs> so how many people do not have a handbook who are here tonight? Wow, there's wow. still quite a few out there then, eh? One, two, three. Yeah, at least three. Okay. Wow. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, if um, yeah, that would that's really nice to know. And um, uh, I I was I told uh, I told the guys I would let people know or ask like among the group 
if there's still people that don't have it. So it's Randy, Bill, and Dwayne. Oh, Dwayne oh, and Brock. And Brock. And Brock. Brock. Okay, so yeah. that's four. Because they're couriered, right? So they're coming by UPS. Is that what or, I heard? Or any or any of them yeah. like could be see, because the other day I got what I believed was a spam a spam that said a failure to to deliver UPS. Oh. But why would they have my email address? Right. So I thought, oh, oh it's my handbook. They there, but that there is a spam it. going around what like that. Well, there is, a, there is a lot of spam like that. that, you know, and then I know, and then, you know, in six months, it'll be Perlator or, yeah. you yeah. know, or oh, they go well, through, I, you know, Amazon and Net next, next month, thing. it'll be CRA. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I was aware of that. I, yeah. I know about spam. I'm very careful. But it was just like, oh, yeah, but that could have been my handbook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And okay. It is possible. I don't. But normally they leave a card if they've been there, right? So well, I've got a gate. So right. they usually just pile things up outside the gate Lori, whenever they Lori, deliver. Lori, they Lori, they don't provide tracking information or anything like that. Um it, it didn't seem as though they were providing the tracking information for the handbooks because there were four thousand five hundred of them. Mm, okay. You know, um uh and I know that um um oh Oh, Chris, help me out here. Um, <laughs> oh goodness, the fellow from the fellow from um, uh, uh, Thunder Bay, Brendan. 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 Brendan was asking as if anybody has still got their tracking form for the if people have got their 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 um, uh, their can books but still have the tracking form. He would really like to have the tracking form and the date in which you received your 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 thing. I told him that I mean mine was long gone because I once I got my handbook I just I just turfed the the um the um uh, the package and I didn't keep you know I didn't keep track of that. But if anybody's got that that information, if you still got the packaging from your handbook. Uh, he would love to have that tracking and and approximately the date in which you got it because he's trying to go back and help the other people. There's still there's still a couple of hundred people that don't have their handbooks. So, yeah, Brendan now uh, Brendan works for Canada Post. Yeah, uh, I wonder if we should just have this discussion now and get it over with. And uh, sure. Um, yeah, please carry on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, so, I'm supposed uh, to get I'm supposed to get these things tomorrow. I mean, the, I actually have a tracking number. The calendars? Yeah, that's what they said. Yes, but I, I don't know. Well, I heard something to the effect that the uh, the calendars are in Nanaimo, so at least they're on the island. Ooh. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, I, it's just I'm going to believe it when I see it, and uh, I. It's probably best that I not go into detail on the, this situation right now, but, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, a little less than two weeks ago, you know, we dedicated practically our whole board meeting to this issue and we thought we were getting it kind of under control. Um, and, uh, uh, and you saw the letter that Robin sent out last week. Uh, and uh, it's become pretty clear to us that uh, we still have a, a huge problem. So I know I had quite a lengthy discussion with Robin yesterday and he okay. was uh, talking to uh, the staff at national office today, um, you know, cause it's just, it's just gone on way, 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 way too long. And uh, you know, pretty well every measure you can think of to get this over with is on the table. Um, I think that's the best way to, uh, to look at it. Um, I think the, ex the experiment with the, uh, uh, the broker is probably uh, going to uh, come to an end and, uh, and there's gonna be some other steps taken to uh, uh, make sure that this gets uh, 
get settled and, and that, that we don't get into a situation like this again. Again. And, uh, you know, uh, we're, we are going to have a, a, a special uh, board meeting to uh, uh, discuss this matter ahead of our usual meeting. And, um, you know, uh, it's just, uh, it, you know, I, I, I don't know what, what else to say because I, I, I was just, uh, I'm just gobsmacked that this is going on. I mean, I was two weeks ago. And if you had told me I would be, we'd still be in this position today, you know, I, you know, I just, it's well, just incredible. Yeah, so, I, I know, I know. And so I, uh, I just, I just want to apologize. And, uh, you know, um, as a, as a, I'm a fellow sufferer, so I don't have to use any lines about feeling your pain or anything like that. There's no RESC calendar there for the first time in years. In years. Um, there there have been two boxes um, I, that I know of that have been two boxes of calendars that have been um, uh, sent. And as Phil Groff told me, he says, you may have 80 calendars, <laughs> you know, come to your door eventually. <laughs> so, uh, so he says, he's you know, they, they've basically lost the first set that nobody seems to know where they are and the second set is supposed to be delivered tomorrow oh. so i as as chris said i will be thrilled if it happens and i will let you know so i'll yes, <sighs> yes and, and i i saw a question from malcolm there uh there's you know there is this issue of uh, of things uh you know, people getting two copies of things, or 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 oh yeah, or or things going to the wrong name or the wrong honorific. I mean, there's been I was just cringing hearing some of the stuff that was going on, and uh, and I think one of the measures uh, is, is, is that will be necessary is that we will be uh, uh, going through our our database and and. And uh, you might be asked to uh, uh, verify the information we have in your, your database. So, uh, uh, but anyway, that's 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 one of the things that's going on. Well, thanks. If you can keep us posted, if we do need to take any steps, that would be great. Just because it's uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a bit of a rough uh, couple of months trying to get things. So, and thank you, Lori, for your perseverance in this matter. <laughs> that's, pretty <Muted. laughs> that's pretty widespread. I think I got a Christmas card today. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, you may I'm not actually <laughs> ever see my face again. Yeah. Yeah. It was from 2020. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Anyways, great. Well, thanks um, for the update. Um, so Randy, are you at a point where you could carry on? Just give me a, a couple of minutes. I'm just finishing a slide. Okay. Uh, well, maybe Nathan, would you like to go first this evening? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll just get this set up. Um, so a bit of the backstory. I took an art course in school this year. All right. Um, that's that's the backstory. So um, in the art course. Um, we were going to do a pastel drawing, so I decided, you know, what better to draw than the planets. So I'm um, just just want to share some of the ones that I drew. Um, so here here are some of them. Um, this one is of Jupiter's great red spot because, you know, Jupiter honestly looks like uh, Van Gogh designed the planet. It is literally the. Um, it is like a Van Gogh painting when you look at some of the images from the Juno uh, spacecraft. Um, so yeah, it, it makes a pretty nice thing to draw as well. Um, Nathan, what did you use as your reference photos? Uh, it was a image from the Juno spacecraft. Ah, thank you. It, it wasn't uh, hand drawn with a telescope, definitely. <laughs> it definitely looks Juno-esque, shall we say. Yeah. 
Uh, so the next one definitely wasn't taken from one of my telescopes. Uh, this is kind of a composite drawing of our planet. Uh, it, it was kind of a reference from an image from the ISS, but I added the moon in as well. Um, just because the moon is nice, of course. Um, you know, I was surprised um, when I drew this because usually when I'm drawing the earth, I'm so used to using just two colors, green and blue, but it turns out uh, most of the earth isn't actually green. So I was interested to see how this color scheme would work out. Uh, next, there, um, so I decided to draw Saturn too, because you know, why not? Saturn's a great planet to draw. Less color, but the details, just the rings are nice to draw as well. Um, you know, that was actually the planet my art teacher wanted me to draw. So, um, you know, by this point, he said I had a bit of a planet collection. So he suggested I draw Saturn and uh, there. <laughs> and uh, lastly, there's one of Mars. Um, this isn't actually from any image because Olympus Mons and Valles Marineris aren't actually that close together. I just wanted to show them both in the image just because they both look very picturesque. Um, so yeah, there's the Martian Grand Canyon, Valles Marineris and Olympus Mons uh, at the top uh, left. Um, and yeah, those are my planetary drawings. And Randy, thank you. you I think you inspired me to do these because of your uh, lunar sketches. So thank you. Um, Nathan, what's your medium? Is it pastel? Uh, or oil pastel. Or? Oil pastel, thank you. I had to like use up about seven or eight black pastels for the backgrounds of these. Um, I don't know how my art teacher felt about that, but it, it was um, pretty costly in terms of pastel, uh, that's for sure. How did you do the white specks, the, the, the stars? Um, those actually weren't intentional. That was just unfilled space, but it does give oh. a nice effect. <laughs> it looks very intentional. Yes, I yeah, was thinking yeah, that that sure does. You have to learn to take credit for things that you didn't do. <laughs> Start on Those some black paper next Nathan. time. <laughs> Sorry, Lori. Those are beautiful. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Yeah, those are great. Those are great. I love, I love this. I love the one that's on the screen here. This, I think that's my favorite one is the earth and the moon. You should you know, post those to the uh, Zenfolio um, gallery. Oh, yes. So other, other yeah. yeah, I can do that. Nathan, I love the fact that you yeah made note of your palette. I mean, you, you've already learned a lot about the colors of these planets. Well, he decided to, my art teacher decided to throw in color theory in the last week. So that was helpful. Very good. The Mars one's very Galileo-like. Yeah. Because if you look at the sketches he did of the moon, they're all wrong. Like he yeah. over dramatized the size of craters and the oh, depths yeah. and like I did, I did a, I did a sketch of the moon with that little tiny telescope I have, and then when I looked at his sketches, it's like, well, why does it look so different? And then I realized he was just doing a representation to show that there were big craters and there was this and that and the shadows right, well, I, and stuff and so. It, and it's a wonderful thing, is, right? Bill. It's a wonderful thing. He was making a point. And there's been lots of discussion about what is that big crater in the middle of his of his uh, diagram. Right. Well, it well is, I guess it is at that there, point, but it's uh, just wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess at that time he was uh, trying to prove to people that the moon wasn't smooth, that it yeah. had regolith. Yeah. So he was exaggerating that. Yeah, yeah. he should he, he should have said not to scale. He would have, he should have just taken an image and boosted the contrast. I mean, why didn't he do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, really nice Nathan I remember um, taking a clay class one time and every time I looked up across from me on the wall was a, a little painting that says there are no mistakes in art and I think you know when we look at the way you rendered some of these things and we compare it to some of the artists people are just talking about uh, you you've shared something you felt through them so I think it's awesome even if it's not 
the stars aren't a perfect picture. They they give the feeling that we need. It's a really nice job. Well, thank you. Mm. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, thanks for sharing those, Nathan. Oh, those are beautiful. Very well. Thank you. I can put them on the portfolio if you want. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I was thinking that you know there there would be uh, if you want to do a, a bigger series there you could uh, you could do a, a Nathan's um, sketches calendar next year see if you had twelve of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little challenge for you. We'll, we'll probably we'll arrive a, on we'll time make a, too. <laughs> we'll make a Renaissance man out of you yet, Nathan. Yes. <laughs> Thanks nice. again. Very good. Um, so Randy, are you? I would be delighted to share my screen. Excellent. And you can show us your artwork. <laughs> Let's start with Bill. So Bill sent around this uh, picture about the uh, Mare Oriental uh, because it really was very well uh, presented. There was a large libration, just background for people if, uh, you need reminding, there's this wonderful tidal locking between the earth and the moon so that the moon's uh, rotation on its axis is exactly the same as the duration of the lunation, except the orbit is elliptical and so when it's closer to the Earth, it moves a bit faster. When it's further from the Earth, it moves a bit slower. And so while it spins at a perfectly uniform rate, it doesn't go around the Earth at a uniform rate. And so there's this, um, it's called a libration, like, like a balance, you know, Libra. Um, it, it, it wobbles back and forth. And there's also a north-south thing, which is a different effect. But we end up seeing 59% of the moon and right on the limb is this beautiful mare but it's very difficult to see because it's right on the edge and um bill if you could talk about this this picture you said you did it over three nights um, as the as the terminator moved so that i could pick up the different sort of shadows the, the libra it was it was almost perfectly timed with the libration so that I could see a little bit more over the edge but the libra the um, terminator was also receding towards the full moon so that I could pick up just a little bit more of the different so you know it was part of it and then part of it so it was added to each night as I could see around the bend and so I just built Bill, you had to synthesize that then. Really, you didn't. You couldn't see that at any given point in time. No, I had to keep adding to the sketch. Right. And I've never tried something like that. That's very inspiring. I, I, I just, I think that's absolutely wonderful. Anyway, um, I will show you a couple of my attempts. So uh, this was part of my uh, Isabel Williamson dossier. Um, the, the right is just a blow up of the left. Um, and this was in uh, a couple of years ago and it was a very good presentation and I could very clearly see the Montes Rook, which is an inner ring around the, the Mare and the Cordillera, which was around it. Um, and it, it's, it's, it was a very good presentation, I, and I don't know that I've seen it better since. This is the one that I did just last week. Um, I, I spent a lot of time uh, trying various uh, filters to see what would give me the best contrast. And by the time I actually started drawing, then I didn't have a lot of time left. Um, so it's not nearly as interesting a, um, a, a drawing. thing that really got me is this Burgius A, which when it's near the Terminator, is just a little crater that you wouldn't notice too much on the rim of a much larger crater uh, called Burgius. But it's obviously very young and uh, has this wonderful ray pattern. 
Um, if I go back, look look at that beautiful set of rays that uh, that Bill drew. Excellent. Anyway, I wasn't really aware of it. In, in 2000, it's just this dot here. I marked it as a bright spot, but I didn't show the rays. Or maybe it's this, and that's part of the rays. I don't know. Anyway, uh, this was the first really good picture. There was a picture by the Russian uh, spaceship, uh, I don't know, 1960. This was later in the 60s, the Lunar Explorer. Um, and it's a beautiful, round, multi-ringed mare. And turns out it is the youngest one. Look at in this puzzle, you can see it's completely different colors because it's a completely different age than all the old mare. And, um, and so the people who mapped this uh, gave it its whole set of, of, of colors. Um, it is crazy old though, by earth standards, it's, they figure it's 3.8 billion years old. And, you know, I do a lot of geology. I have never seen a 3.8 billion year old rock. They're very, very rare. Um, the oldest rock on Earth is 4.1 billion. Um, basically, the Earth doesn't really start accumulating a bunch of crust till about two and a half billion years ago. So a lot of the Canadian shield is two and a half billion. 3.8 is crazy old, but on the moon, it's crazy young. I have to show you this picture, Tom Glenn. I'm going to have to do a um, whole presentation on Tom Glenn someday. I think... He is the most amazing lunar photographer. And the thing that really gets me, I watched a YouTube, he started in 2015. He didn't have a telescope until six or seven years ago. Anyway, look at the resolution and, and the, the, the details and the contrast. Like, just understand that when you see the rays of Burgius A, that means the sun is reflecting straight down. You wouldn't see that with an oblique um, sunlight, you, you, this would all be, you know, like like the the, the rays of, of the rest of the moon. The fact that you're seeing the rays means that it's almost vertically down sunlight. And yet it looks with the contrast uh, between the darks and the lights, you can, you can see um, so much detail and you can totally see that we're talking about a mare of, you know, it's something like 600 kilometers across um, to with the Cordillera and the Rook Mountains. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, so let's talk a bit about the Mare Oriental. It's on the edge. It's very hard to see. So, oh, I didn't put the date on. Uh, Schroeder was 1802. I thought I wrote that in. He's the first one to, to actually kind of map that there's something going on there. And uh, then... The Cordillera Mountains were named in 1834. <clears throat> Julius Schmidt um, was the first to really say there's a mare over there. This is not just a crater. Um, although the way Shaler, who is an American, um, put it is that it's probably the wall of a crater having a diameter of several hundred miles. So th there's lots of indications of it happening there, but it wasn't on a map until 1906 on a German map. And you don't see it on a British map for decades later, which is really interesting. Like it, this is a grand time of lunar, of selenology. Lots of people were, were, were mapping this. Uh, Wilkins very clearly marked it, but he called it Lunar Mare X. Patrick Moore, um, let me, um, I'm going to unshare so I can show you some things. So in this wonderful book, if you don't know Patrick Moore, he's the grand old man of BBC, um, BBC uh, astronomy. He was on for like 50 years doing a weekly The Sky Tonight, um, very beloved in England. And he says that he discovered it in 1948. And it was only in this book, he talks about it being, um, he has a fatherly connection with it because he discovered it 
Um, and this book was in the, I think in the nineties, but um, it, it, it really, he, he did not have precedence. It was certainly Franz is the first person to uh, map and name the Mare Oriental in 1907. And there's this wonderful, uh, heavy book. There are three of these by Robert Garfinkel and he goes into the history in great detail um, about who saw it when, and and um, he says, nothing against Patrick Moore, but he's not right in this case. And it turns out in the, I think in the, uh, about 10 years ago, Moore did accept that Franz was the one who has uh, priority in the discovery and naming of the Mare Oriental. But there's a problem. Oh, yeah, and it wasn't until 1964 that the IAU finally accepted it as a named feature, as an officially named feature on the moon. But Oriental means east, the eastern sea. And it is in the southwest. And I was talking about this at dinner with my family, and it's still great. So, so, so what you always read about is that in 1961, the IAU reversed east and west on the moon because they were getting to, you know, the modern age of, of exploring and they knew there was going to be a moonshot and things. And it was just too complicated to have the east on the left. And I tried to say at dinner, it, it, it's because if you're on the moon, the sun rises from the other direction. And we pulled out my lunar globe. Okay, so let's just see. So uh, where are we? This is the north up here. And you can see the Maricrisium over here. That is the... Currently, we call that the east. Oh, come on. There we go. But until 1961, that was the west. And the Mare Oriental. Oh, my goodness. How, where is that? That is here. That ring structure there. So that is on the left side. I hope it isn't reversed for you. I, you know, Zoom does weird things. Um, but we could not figure out what astronomers were thinking when they put the east on the left. And if anybody has any way of helping understand, and this wasn't just a couple. My, my father-in-law says it's very simple. They were looking at a French map where O is the west, but in German, O is east, and they got mixed up. It's West and, and Ost. That's a joke for anybody who speaks German and French. Anyway, um, does anybody have any insight? I think this is going to have to be the topic of a whole other Astro Cafe talk in the future when I finally figure it out. Uh, wait a minute, Randy. Can you explain that all again, please? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just so kidding. the West until 1961 is on the left, but the name, the Mare Oriental, wasn't accepted until 1964. So this Western Sea is called the Eastern Sea officially by the same body that switched things around. Thank you. Bizarre. So that's what I'm going to leave you with. And if anybody can help, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Are there questions for uh, Randy about that? Hearing none, so, uh, Rich, did oh, you want to? Oh, carry on. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, Randy and Bill, uh, uh, um, like how how many times a year can you see this? Like that. I think it's every couple of years. Yeah, it's okay. probably because you've got all of those various factors of what are what time of day is it for us? Oh right. 
Okay. And then, you know, so in theory, it could wobble in that direction probably more than once a year, but whether we can actually see it or not, see it clearly or not, is another question. Is it in the sky for us? Is it the right time of the day, et cetera, et cetera? Good question, yeah. Laurie, and I should try to, I, I have not really got a handle on libration. It, it's 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 an yeah, uh, aspect which is fascinating, and I love looking at things that are over the rim and looking at the North Pole and the South Pole. Those those are um, they're exotic. I really like seeing Bailey, which is the largest crater. So not a mare, the largest crater. You only see it when you you get a good view of the South. You can get become a nine percent moon viewer. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I I knew that it wouldn't be like it wouldn't be um like regu like regular in that you know every so and so like you could find it out like it it would depend on where it was in its where it where it was in its um uh its rotation and stuff like that. So I just wasn't I just didn't know I didn't know whether it was it like every year or once every two years or once every five years or you know something like that. I didn't know. So it's not every year. Okay. I, I wonder. Yeah. I wonder if the major planetarium programs would be um, ah. uh, smart enough to be able to depict that and maybe even search for it. I'll, I'll have a look in SkyX. I'm not sure yeah. if Stellarium has as good a maybe a moon map as uh, as SkyX, but well, and one of the moon um, one of the moon apps may be better for that too. But again, you've got to figure out what time that is for for us. We get into that whole issue of then would we see it? <laughs> well, it might it might be a good research uh, topic for everybody yeah. here in the audience. Uh, if you have different kinds of simulation software, see see if there's a way of predicting this. Well, when I did that sketch, I know that I knew that it was coming up. Like I heard it, read it somewhere online. Oh, yeah, Sky and Telescope always gets a bit excited before it happens and talks about it and. It, yeah, it's a thing it that, that gets talked about. So it's a predictable thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's probably just not that frequent, I guess, or not that good that frequently, I guess. Very good. Thanks, Reg. Did you want to say anything further? Uh, uh, yes, if it's OK, I'll try and share the screen. Yeah, please do. And I will go to PowerPoint. Can anyone see anything there? Mm -hmm. We have okay. it. Um, this was something, there's about a handful of people in the audience tonight who've seen this presentation at uh, Astro Cafe um, in 2017. Uh, the fall of 2017, I and many others were still basking in the afterglow of the wonderful uh, uh, an eclipse that took place on, I think it was August 21st um, of that year. So let's see here. Um, and this was all launched, this uh, was launched, we, we had a, a, a session that was modestly called the Astro Cafe Great Solar Eclipse After Party. And um, uh, we all had great fun showing uh, our results and photos at this, uh, uh, of the eclipse. And Dorothy Paul mentioned discerning mountains on the lunar limb at the third contact. And you can see this is a little uh, uh, um, zoom uh, of her mountains that she thought she saw. And uh, this really quite intrigued me. And I wondered, uh, I had taken some photos and I thought, uh, I'm going to hunt for uh, mountains on my eclipse photos. And the scope of the project expanded into a mission of measurement, which led to an identity crisis that became the Lunar Alpine Quest. And uh, it was an activity of dubious scientific value, but it was a lot of fun. And I learned a lot. And if anything, I would call this uh, presentation fun with trigonometry. So here we go. So the weapon I used was uh, I was down in Monmouth, Oregon, and uh, I took a C8 uh, with a, a, a solar shield on it. 
And uh, this was absolutely the wrong type of telescope to use. And it was the biggest one in the field. And I collected um, uh, uh, crowds around my telescope because people were, uh, it, it looked a bit more intriguing to others than the small one, small refractors that were a lot better. And uh, uh, to orient yourself, uh, this shoe belongs to Gary Sedan as well as the Hawaiian shirt. And if you look at this line here, it very nicely, we were set up in a, a soccer field and or a football field and he very thoughtfully put the line on a north south axis. So it was great for polar alignment. So I couldn't have asked for better. At any rate, I had a Canon T3i uh, single lens reflex camera. And uh, I uh, really, I had a, it was F10, so the field of view was larger than the, the uh, diameter of the, uh, the moon. I couldn't fit the entire moon or sun in the image, so that was a, a mistake on my part. Um, so this just shows you some of the uh, pictures as the uh, sun came around, uh, the moon uh, traversed the sun, and first contact here. And look at this beautiful collection of sunspots. They're probably the most photographed sunspots in history as the moon came across. And as it worked its way down, uh, there you can see sunspots down in the lower part as well. And that will be part of the focus of the talk. Um, and then uh, this is a second contact uh, when uh, totality occurred. And I just lucked out to get an image of the uh, chromosphere um, for a, a little bit. And uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, can we see mountains here? And if you look at this image here, it's a little bit lumpy. It's not a perfect uh, uh, surface here along the terminator uh, of the, or the limb of the moon. And uh, here there's some little bumps and things like that. And if you zoom it up, it's more apparent. So what I did is that I, first of all, took these images and put them in a program called GIMP, which is wonderful, it's free. And I measured the uh, number of pixels between this, uh, the moon and this picture and uh, this location here. And I did a similar measurement uh, with the uh, limb of the moon and the same spot in a, another shot that was taken 24 seconds later. And I also measured the height of this mountain, which is the biggest mountain I could find on the uh, limb of the, the, uh, the, the uh, moon. So uh, indeed, I think they were um, uh, mountains. So the next thing is, can we actually estimate the height of the mountains? And, uh, and if the mountain subtends an, an angle M and uh, the height of the mountain is just the distance to the moon times the sine of that angle. And it, uh, the great thing for me was that for this eclipse, a lot of people worked out all of the stuff, so I didn't have to figure it out myself. And, and the, on August 21st, the uh, distance of the moon was uh, 365,600 kilometers. And all we had to do is measure the angle of the moon. But how do we do that? Well, if somebody determined that the, at the time of the eclipse, the angular diameter of the sun was this big long number, about half a degree, and if we did, uh, if we have to do, all we have to do is measure the height of the mountain in pixels and compare it to the equator, equatorial diameter of the sun in pixels. But I did not squeeze the equatorial diameter of the sun in one image, so I had a problem. But why not use these sunspots? Um, if we measure the time it takes for the moon to traverse a sunspot, would that work? So somebody predicted that first contact was as, uh, at this time here, around 16.05 uh, uh, universal coordinated time. And uh, the second contact occurred at 17.16. And uh, I could calculate the angular speed of the moon. So between the first contact and the second contact was 71.77 minutes. And the moon traversed uh, this angle of the sun. 
So that gives me the moon was moving at 0 0.440 arc seconds per unit second. Uh, so arc second is a measure of degree, uh, where a second is a measure of time. So we, we know that much. Then if I measured the distance here in pixels was 34 pixels compared to this one, 24 seconds apart was 6.7 pixels. You can measure that uh, in 24 seconds, it traveled uh, nearly 28 pixels. And so what I did was I uh, used GIMP. We determined that the moon traveled um, uh, nearly 28 pixels in four, 24 seconds, which was 1.15 pixels per second. And if we determined that the moon traveled 0.44 arc seconds per second, uh, so in one second, it traveled 1.15 pixels and 0.44 arc seconds. So one pixel is equal to 0 0.038 arc seconds. So I've got, a, got the image calibrated. So we know that the moon was four pixels high. So you multiply four by this uh, value of 0.383 arc seconds per six pixel. And you've got the that mountain uh, subtending an angle of 1.57 arc seconds. So we just have to pl plug that into the formula. So we have that's the angle. We put that, this angle for sine m. And uh, so the height is, is the, the distance of the moon times this value. And it turns out to be about 9,000 square, uh, 9,000 uh, feet high or 2,784 2, meters. And that doesn't sound too bad. That's a little, slightly less than the height of Mount Baker. So it's kind of in the ballpark. But while we're at it, we can also calculate the height of the chromosphere. So somebody determined uh, that the distance to the sun at that uh, time was uh, uh, 1.513, no, what, what is that? This big long number here. 15 million kilometers away. And uh, a portion of the chromosphere was likely already uh, obscured by when the image was taken. So the estimate is a lower bound for the height of the bright portion of the chromosphere. And again, we're using the same idea, distance to the sun times the sine of the angle of the chromosphere. And in this case, the uh, chromosphere is about 13 pixels deep. And uh, it uh, turns out to be 4.98 arc seconds. And so that turns out to that the chromosphere has a height of around uh, 3,654 kilometers. And that seems uh, pretty reasonable, actually. I think the, the, the chromosphere's the depth, its maximum depth is around 6,000 kilometers, something like that. So can we identify the mountains? Well, this is a lot harder to do. So what I did was the silhouette of the mountain is located along the luminar limb at the time of the eclipse. And there is an absolutely fabulous program called Solar Eclipse Maestro that can determine the mountain profile for any solar eclipse. And it's based on very accurate elevations obtained by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And it predicts the lunar latitude of the second contact it would be 11 degrees north latitude on the lunar uh, uh, latitude scale. And this is the profile that they, they, they drive with this thing. This is the, the moon. This is the actual C2 is uh, this is the, if you had a perfectly round sphere, it would be along this little dashed line here. And this location here is around uh, uh, 11 degrees north latitude. And um, I'll just uh, work that out. So on my, my map, how can I find out the latitude of the second contact? What I do is I take a cord and bisect it and the second contact is here. So that's the location of the second contact. And the mountain of interest I have is down here. So how do I calculate the latitude uh, of uh, this, this particular mountain? Well, what I do is um, I remember those sunspots and uh, the solar dynamic sur uh, survey and the solar uh, heliospheric observatory have fabulous on online archives. 
And I used a grid from those maps and overlaid it to get a rudimentary estimated latitude. So here is the, uh, uh, the image for eclipse day. And you can see there was uh, sunspots in the center and these are the ones of interest here. So what I do is I rotate it into uh, an angle like that and I merge it with the, um, the, the chromosphere image and I, I can see that the sunspots are fairly close to this area here. And uh, from that, I, uh, on this particular map, I, I felt that the, uh, my estimate well, using that grid, which is pretty sloppy really, not precision work, was around 15 degrees north and the latitude of that mountain of interest was around one degree south uh, latitude. And when you correct for it, uh, 15 degrees north was really supposed to be 11 degrees north on that day. And they, they treat their latitudes going from north to south. So uh, um, uh, 79 degrees would be the uh, latitude of uh, second uh, contact. And that mountain would be a latitude of 95 degrees uh, going from north. And there's a gap of interest as well here that I was going to talk about as well. So with that, saying that, if I put that here and match it up to the profile that we got from that uh, wonderful uh, Maestro program, you can see that uh, this lines up with some sort of a mountain ridge here. And there's a, uh, an area where the mountains just over the horizon must be so high that they block out the light from the sun altogether. So we have a, a hole in the chromosphere that we don't see and something lines up with something here. So what I wanted to do is figure out if we could get a, a view from the sky and look down on it and uh, what region uh, it was. Now, it, the agreement was not compelling uh, if we check the aerial view to find the surrounding craters involved, um, we can use the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera website. And I caution anybody, don't go there unless you've got time because it's a black hole. I, I spent hours and hours enjoying myself uh, examining the various features on the moon. It's just an absolutely fabulous site. And uh, in order to do this, uh, to use this property, we need to know the longitude of the limb at the time of the eclipse. And Randy was mentioning libration. So there's two different features with libration. There's the, uh, the due to the tilt. Um, uh, there's the, uh, if this is the plane of the earth, the, the moon is tilted at 6.8 degrees. And that uh, sometimes the, you can see that uh, we would be able to see um, craters here, and at other times we'd be able to see craters here that would normally be obscured. So that's the effect of the um, uh, the, uh, the the tilt of the axis. But also, as Randy mentioned, uh, uh, there's a liberation due to the uh, elliptical shape of the orbit as well. So at certain times, you could see a maximum 7.9 degrees. Um, uh, from the, the moon in one, one direction and, and the opposite on the other side as well. So you get to see a little bit at the eclipse time, uh, the libration, longitudinal libration was five degrees. And uh, so that corresponded to a limb latitude of 84.75 degrees west. So what you can do is get an image here. And this is where I saw the beautiful sketch from um, that, that was done by uh, uh, Randy, and and it, it was uh, and there were craters mentioned on it, uh, and uh, uh, so I I could this rang the um, the. Uh, uh, the bell for me that I, I've had this beforehand. So that's why you're subjected to, to it now. And if you look at this, uh, roughly there's the clump of mountains here that correspond to this. And uh, there's a ridge of mountains down here that could contribute to that. So we're, we're getting close, but you can also get the, the lunar latitude from, you can get an elevation map 
and the uh, the latitude longitude grid uh, from this uh, website that I showed you. And uh, this is the predicted line of the limb of the moon, but um, at the time of the eclipse. But you only have to have a little bit of error uh, one way or the other to have a huge error in the mountain estimate. So it's uh, very hard to really uh, accurately predict that. But uh, the way this is lined up here, these mountains here, I think, are causing the blocking there. And uh, this ridge here is causing the, um, the mountain there. So, so at any rate, uh, I went into gory detail of it. And if I go back here, this is the um, uh, crater Schuler. And uh, I think that uh, Bill Weir and, and uh, Randy also uh, labeled that uh, or possibly some nearby uh, craters on their sketches as well. So, uh, this is the uh, looking down from the uh, uh, or Oriental Mare. Uh, this is uh, Schuler here, the uh, and uh, uh, the uh, mountain that I uh, found was uh, in this area here, and these uh, hills here uh, block that one area where there's a gap where we don't see any corona at all. So, at any rate. Um, and here's another uh, another nice shot of uh, Mary Oriental, and um, and uh, I know that uh, Bill Weir had uh, the, he identified this crater here, and that rang the bell, and, and uh, that's why we're seeing this right now. And the crater Schuler that uh, uh, caused that mountain, my image is right here. So. And this is a, a, a shot that you would get uh, from the Ruckel catalog where he has beautiful sketches, if anybody has the, the lunar catalog there. And this is the crater Schuler here and uh, the, uh, uh, the mountains that Randy was talking about there. So in summary then, the lunar mountains found uh, on the eclipse photos um, the uh, were seemed reasonable and the height was uh, uh, fairly reasonable. The lower bound of the eclipse uh, value uh, uh, was uh, pretty pretty good. And the agreement between the predicted lunar profile and the observed profile was modest to perform, but uh, the profile very may be very sensitive to libration. But I reckon Dorothy really did see some lunar mountains. So good, good for Dorothy on that. So, uh, and I would like to thank a bunch of somebodies who predicted all those uh, numbers that I used in the equations. And there's a list of uh, some amazing um, uh, uh, sites that I, um, I, I had a lot of fun exploring the moon with. So just something to, uh, to leave you with. And I think, with that, I'll stop the share and turn it back to you. Okay, <clears throat> Reg, that is totally brilliant. And uh, I now know for sure that my mind and your mind do not work the same way. <laughs> yeah, I, I need clinical help, I think. <laughs> well, thanks for presenting that again. Actually, I'd forgotten about that. So it was good to, good to see it again. Um, yeah, very interesting work. And, uh, yeah. So there we go. So next uh, next time we get a chance to see an eclipse, uh, look for mountains along the uh, limb. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Any uh, more comments or questions? Or uh, and Dave, can you get ready? Yes. Yeah. Right. It was it was fortunate that. Uh... Reg decided to drag down that big telescope because I mean no one else would get that kind of resolution. So yeah. that was that was fortuitous in many ways. Yeah, what uh, was Dorothy accident. using? <laughs> Pardon me? What was Dorothy using then? If she oh. was I probably think probably binos. And I, memory. I she remember. she sketched it. I remember her telling us that she sketched it from memory because she didn't do any sketching while she was watching the eclipse, which is quite remarkable. <laughs> I got some pretty good mountain outlines on one of my uh, eclipse shots. It was 
with just a projection from my uh, Dobsonian. Dragon that was an eight inch, inch right? Uh, yeah, it's on Zenfolio. I guess I could find that. Yeah, if it's if it's nearby, you could flash yep. that up. That be neat. Oh yeah, I saw that when I was skulking through Zenfolio looking for that supernova remnant. Lots of you guys have caught it already. Can you guys see? No. Yeah. Yeah. That Down in this region here, I swear there's some. It's bumpy. It's definitely bumpy. This was, uh, and this was actually the one I did just by projecting. Mm onto this easel and uh, basically went up to it with my camera and took a picture of the easel. But there's definitely some, wow. it certainly looks like there's mountains in that uh, lower region there, so. That's a neat photograph, that really yeah. turned out well. <laughs> well, I've got this up. I've also, I could show uh, Thursday night, I actually managed to get a, Ooh. a picture. Mm. Rare, clear weather in January, so. And also did uh, a starless version. Wow. Um, turned out well. Uh, Brock, is that a, an accumulation of a number of nights or just the one night? That's just one night. And I kind of rushed the processing. I think I could do better, but it was, I was working all week and I was tired and busy and oh. didn't really get a lot of time to focus on so how it. Much, how much accumulated time is that? Um, that's a good question. I'd have to double check my notes. I think I actually put it into Zenfolio, didn't I? And I put a comment in there. Five hours, 50 minutes. Oh. Wow. So. Very nice. Mm -hmm. That turned out well. <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, so, uh, Dave, we have a couple of items from Edmonton, and hopefully sure. Dave will be able to show this video. Yeah, I'm working with a new iPad, so we may have a little issue here, but we'll see how it goes. I'm going to share a content first, if I can get this thing to work. There you go. Come on, come on up here. Okay, so this, uh, if you can see this. I trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bunch of scars. This photo oh, was was taken. Well, it was a short movie actually taken by Abdul Anwar. He now lives in Cochrane, just west of Calgary. He says he imaged the James West spell telescope. Telescope. Yeah, the James West space something. telescope. If you oh, see this little cool. dot that's moving across here, and I'll play that again. You can see that little dot moving up there. That's the James Webb, James Webb Telescope. That was January the 24th, just after it got to the L2 orbit, one and a half million kilometers away. He says at this distance, it's equivalent to seeing a Canadian $2 coin at a distance of 2000 kilometers. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> so. It's something like a magnitude 16 or 17. And yeah. I don't really have a good feeling for, in our club, who is able to actually see um, features down at that magnitude. Like, is that yeah. a really difficult object to image? Yeah, Dave, and it's, Dave, Dave, is this a RASA? This is a RASA, right? Yeah, yeah, it is an RASA, yeah. And, so it's like an F2? If, if he's in Cochrane, if he's just outside of Cochrane, He's a long way from any really bright lights. Uh, yeah. it, it's a pretty would be a, a good night out there. You'd get some laminar flow over the mountains, and he would get a pretty good sky. So we'll probably see more from Anwar when he is uh, when he's back there. Um, so I'll stop screen sharing for the moment, if I can. There we go. Now the next little one is we've we've seen lots of good photos of people who have done observation, but uh, I've got an observing report from Luca Van Zella, and it's all text. <laughs> I'll read it for you because it's oh, quite, and I thought it would be interesting for you. This is one way of, observe, of recording what you've observed. So he says, 
The clear sky chart and spot WX models indicated there would be some clear skies in amongst the swaths of cirrus cloud yesterday evening. Seeing as the temperatures would not be too cold, and given that it had been a long time since I'd had a chance to do the dark sky observing, I decided to head to Black Nugget Lake Park, which is east of Edmonton, and put his telescope through its paces. Uh, Jay Lavender joined me, and we had a nice evening of observing in spectroscopy. The wind calmed down, the dew stayed away, and the winter sky beckoned. And even in late January, as darkness falls, the top of Cygnus is still visible in the west. I visited a few old old friends in Orion and Auriga, and then observed a few NGCs in Cancer, Gemini, Monasteros, and some. So here's some sidelights. NGC 1893, a nice large cluster that reminded me of the Starfleet symbol. M67, very nice cluster. I studied for a long while and noticed for the first time a tiny box asterism inside the cluster at the end of the hockey stick asterism. How appropriate is the orders were on the way to win over the predators. NGC 2158, very nice compact cluster with a handful of brighter stars and a goal of thousands of stars. Better and better the longer I looked at it. IC 2157, Five stars in the shape of a V with a few other stars and a glow of dim stars. There was also a Sagita asterism nearby. NGC 2244. No chance for the Rosette Nebula, but this evening the open cluster resembled a hippopotamus face with a crooked nose. I'd never seen that impression before. And then M42 closed up the evening with a good long look at the classic in a 10 millimeter Delos eyepiece so that was good contrast in the Coria. It's a good night to get out under the stars again. So that's a way of recording your observations that is not done with a sketch or with, uh, with photographs. Something we might consider from time to time. Yeah, that's classic. Yeah. Something I do a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, with Evernote, right? <laughs> right? Right down what I see. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and just you could share that because I'm sure that those of us who have seen those objects would recognize some of those descriptions. And maybe yeah, if we didn't recognize them, we'd look for them the next time. Yeah, that kind of aligns a little bit with uh, Charles Annis's, uh, uh asterism talk as well. So there's yeah. there's a lot to be done with the with the written word as well. Yeah, yeah. So thought that was of interest for tonight. That's it from Edmonton this week. Well, thanks for uh, showing those to us, uh, Dave. Um, that was the end of the list that I have for tonight. Um, oh, no, David, sorry. I almost missed you there. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so I just wanted to remind uh, uh, people there, there's two SIGs uh, this week. Uh, the uh, Getting Started in Astronomy group is meeting tomorrow night. And, and I'm, I'm pleased to welcome um, Susan and Jill to uh, present on the Gemini constellation tomorrow night. Uh, really looking forward to that. Uh, and also we're going to have some time to talk uh, about any observations people have made for uh, since since the last month. Um, the uh, one on Thursday is uh, on EAA or electronically assisted astronomy. And I'm also talking to the Kingston Center a couple of hours before that meeting uh, about uh, using video uh, video streaming with telescopes. So I'm, I'm sure that'll be an active discussion. So uh, quite aligned with EAA as well. Uh, so that's what we have for this week in, in terms of SIGs. Oh, uh, in the beginner SIG, I'm gonna actually talk about a occultation of the moon that's gonna occur on the morning right after the AGM. So that'll be February 22nd, quite early in the morning for people, may, 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 maybe not for everybody, but I think it's about 2.45 in the morning on February 22nd, but it should be quite nice. If you've never seen an occultation before, um, try to prepare for that and maybe stay up a little, a little bit for that night or, or, or get, up, get up after the AGM, I guess, just take a nap after the AGM. So that's it, thank you. Great, thanks David. And Chris Gaynor, maybe the final word to you today. Okay, um, a very short uh, thing about James Webb. Uh, 
the, the big news in the past week is that they have switched on uh, the instruments for the first time and they all seem to be functional. There's quite a good article in the Globe and Mail that was in the Saturday paper and uh, uh, about the Canadian instrument, the uh, uh, nearest, the near infrared uh, imager uh, slitless spectrograph, I think it's called. Um, and I just put the uh, link for it up in the chat. Uh, so uh, if you haven't had a chance to uh, to look at it, you should uh, you should check that out. So that's the the, the main news from Web. Um, we've been talking a lot about the moon, and uh, um, I'm not doing sketches of the moon, but I like writing about the moon. Um, and uh, just a reminder that the current issue of JRASC. Um, I think the February issue has a, an article that I wrote uh, about how the uh, Apollo, last three Apollo crews uh, trained for their flights in Canada uh, and, and what they did. And, uh, and Apollo 16, and the anniversary is coming up in April, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 16, they actually wound up talking about Sudbury, which was where one of the places they trained. And uh, so you can read about that. I also, uh, there'll be a little uh, story in the next issue of uh, Sky News about Apollo 16, but uh, the more comprehensive one is in, uh, is in JRASC. Uh, and uh, I think I'm gonna uh, uh, talk about one more thing, uh, in my Hubble book. Um, so, uh, I've had a bit of uh, you know communi uh, confusing communications with NASA, but uh, uh, they are going to be sending me some copies of the book, uh, which uh, hopefully I will have in time for our uh, uh, FDAO event in May. Um, and um, uh, there's been a, a kind of a change in the distribution in other parts of the country. So I'm just, I just wanted to tell you that I'm getting a bunch of copies here uh, and uh, we'll be talking about that in due course. Uh, but um, when they finally printed it, uh, they, uh, NASA announced that you could just send an email to NASA and they would send you a copy. And that wasn't the case for Canada. And we were, we were talking about selling some through the RESC and NASA didn't like that idea very much. So I'm going to be announcing pretty soon. And of course, this would be, I, I don't know if Peter's still on this, uh, this call or any, anybody from out of town, but uh, uh, they decided that it's, it probably makes more sense to uh, uh, just uh, uh, S send copies to people from Canada who request copies as well, which they weren't doing at the beginning. And I'll be announcing this on on uh, on, on a couple of websites and things like this. But I wanted to mention that I'm still getting copies for distribution in and around Victoria. Um, just uh, just so there's no confusion on that. And if if for some reason you have a question, don't be afraid. Uh, to uh, to ask me, but yeah, if I was Peter, I, I would I would be sending off an email to NASA. So, Chris, Chris, you're going to be doing um, a launch uh, at one of the FDAO uh, nights. That's right. right. That's right. And I'm planning to have uh, have some copies on hand there. Um, so uh, as as we get closer to the time, uh, uh, Lori and I, I'm sure, will be letting you in on what's what's going on. Great, well, thanks for those updates. And it's, uh, I'm glad we're getting closer to actually being able to see a print copy while you've seen one, but of course the rest of us would like to see one too. <laughs> yes. Very good. And um, so I was wrong about that. So the final word to El Presidente, Randy. Thank you so much. So uh, yes, a few hours before the lunar occupation, we are indeed holding our annual general meeting. Uh, 
it was advertised at 7.30, but I had a correspondence with our uh, guest speaker who lives in Hamilton, so is three hours uh, ahead of us. And um, he, he would love it if we started at 10 o'clock his time rather than 10.30. That means we will start at 7. We'll advertise this uh, in emails and distribute widely. His title is The Life and Times of the Sky Quality Meter. So this is of great interest to uh, everybody who's going to participate in our sky uh, light pollution survey, uh, I hope, this coming autumn. Uh, Doug Welch, he is something like Assistant Dean of Science at McMaster. I, I have to, I will work on his biography, but also uh, some people in the club will remember him from when he did his postdoc here, and I gather he was quite active with the Victoria Center, and he's very pleased to uh, be able to, to come back, at least virtually, for our uh, as our keynote at our AGM. So, AGM, Monday the 21st, so three weeks from now, starting at 7, and uh, we'll, we'll start with our guest speaker, uh, Doug Welch. Thank you very much, everybody. This was a really fun uh, Astro Cafe. I, I enjoy the discussions. I enjoy seeing you every week. Well, thank you very much for the uh, and the update and letting us know about that. Does anybody else have anything before we call us an evening? Uh, Chris, I just have one one little question. Sure. Um, I am looking for uh, magazine file holders. Um, so you know the like the, the boxes that you put you put magazines in. Um, we've got hundreds of magazines that I have to go through at the at the um, up at the center of the universe. We're going through them, and I want to keep some copies. And I just would like to have some file folders. I will go out and buy some. But I was thinking maybe within this group there might be some people with old you know older ones that they're just kind of. They've, they've got somewhere in a cupboard or something like that that they haven't used. And if anybody's got any extra ones that they can let me have, just simply email me. Thank you. That would okay. be great. Yeah, so please get in touch with Lori. Yeah. And Peter, you have your hand up. Yeah, hi, good evening from Kenny O. Hill, everybody. I just wondered if anybody's interested, the Hamilton Center is going to be having a lecture about the Aurora um, on Thursday night. Would you like me to post the link or do you think no one would want to do that? Oh, okay, start with us, that'd be great. I think it went out on the national email list in the forum. Um, yeah. yeah, okay, so all right. So just a reminder that it's there then. Th thanks. Thank you for uh, reminding us of that. Yeah, so is, that is on there. Let me just... Do a sudden salutation for us, Peter. <laughs> a sun salutation? Uh, just, you know, just, just wave at the sun. Just wave at the sun yeah. for us and say hello. Yeah. That's that thing we forget what it looks like. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. We had a good day, but. I've, yeah. I've been keeping tabs on the weather in Southern Ontario, of course, where it's been really cold and there, there's a huge snowstorm predicted mm -hmm. for the end of the week, but I haven't really been watching too closely how things have been in Victoria. So I hope you guys are enjoying your weather. Yeah, we're in. Well, we did actually have a few clear days. Well, with yeah. some fog interspersed, so it was- That's good. Yeah. But sun, still, it's, sun it's today. not 24 degrees, so there you no, go. No, no. <laughs> I saw my first shirtless guy today. Yeah, there's we people around in shorts already. And oh, shorts for sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, this was, yeah. he was walking on the goose just sort of around uptown area. And I'm Probably driving to town with my Edmonton. wife. And it's like, <laughs> oh, look, first shirtless guy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh dear. Yeah, he maybe, should maybe he should have kept his shirt on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why is he that funny blue color? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I saw some snowdrops today. Oh yes. Yes. Oh yeah. We've got certainly got those. And yeah. then we had a hailstorm, so we had it all today. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. Anyways, well, thank you for joining us tonight. So we're Thanks, back everybody. for our first meeting in February next week.
Okay, thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Good night.